Well, it's, it's good to be back in the house of the Lord. I, I've missed you all. It's been, uh, it seems like it's been forever. Um, uh, I, I really needed some time just to kind of rest, and uh, I got that. Uh, I didn't get half as much of the things I wanted to get done, done, but it just seems like nowadays with all that's going on, it's just so much of a hassle to do anything or to go anywhere. So, you know, I was just uh, more than happy just to kind of just get some rest. Amen. So, uh, and I, I kind of look at this passage here today and kind of see it a little bit of the same way. Um, things at this time in this, uh, with Haggai and the remnants of Israel, they, they, they had uh, they were facing all kinds of opposition. There was all kind of things going on that all kind of external issues that just uh, just made them perhaps feel that it, it wasn't worth it. And so we'll get into this today. Um, I want to just give you a big, a bit of a some background on this book. It is a post-exilic book, and that this is uh, when the Israelites uh, they had begun to leave out of exile. Remember Jeremiah, he prophesied that they would go into exile. The Babylonians came under King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, conquered uh, Judea, destroyed the temple, and he had taken them all off into exile, into Babylon. Um, It was when the Persians came about 70 years later, conquered uh, the Babylonians, and the Persians under King Cyrus was they, they, they had a complete opposite uh, way of ruling. They said, no, we don't want to take you into captivity. We, we're going to send you back. So they sent all of those that the Babylonians have, had taken captive. They sent them back home and said, go and worship your gods and continue your way of life. They, they saw that as a, a, a clever way of, of managing the people. Uh, and it was, it was. And so uh, if you're familiar with... Um, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, you know that uh, that first remnant of Israel had come back into uh, Judea, Judah and had begun to um, rebuild the temple. They'd laid the foundation of it and they'd begun to uh, offer sacrifices and offerings in the temple. And as they were getting going, uh, they encountered all kinds of opposition. And so the construction of the temple was halted and they were worshiping uh, or sacrificing in this sort of dilapidated uh, platform or foundation of what the temple used to be. And so it's been about 16 years since this reconstruction began, as you pick up here in verse 1, and uh, the foundation, like I said, the foundation had been laid and they'd been offering sacrifices, but not much had been done uh, since then. So this is where we pick up here in verse 1. And it reads, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. And so I'll, I'll look at this. You, you, you see this, okay, this son and, and this father of this person, you see this, and this is key. This is key to this, this, this first understanding of this. I, I know we come across these chapters, these verses, these long genealogies, and we typically skip over that. We skip over entire books when we come to that. We don't see the point of it. But this is where this comes in handy, these long genealogies. You know, this one begot that one, that one begot that one. Everybody who we forgot got begot, and this is how we got what we got. (laughs) This is where it comes into handy, because, see, we can trace this. Uh, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, we can trace him all the way back to David. We can look at... Uh, Josedek, and trace him all the way back to Aaron. And what this tells us is that the, 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 the priesthood, the high priesthood was preserved. The kingship, the Davidic lineage was preserved. Here we have these people and they're, they're, they're reluctant to begin and complete the work of the Lord. But yet you see here in this opening verse that God, preserved the leadership of Israel. 
through exile, through being conquered, conquered twice. The Babylonians conquer them, and then the, uh, the Persians conquer the Babylonians, and so they changed possession. And so we see here that God, in his sovereignty, has the power, he has the authority to preserve his plan. Do you see that? That wasn't enough. That was not enough for them. Look at here in verse 2. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. This, this Lord Almighty, Yahweh, Yahweh Sebiot. Typically, the, uh, the more literal translations will render this Lord of hosts. The more paraphrased versions will render this Lord of armies, Lord of the heavenly armies. And this is what he's saying. Look at who's addressing you. The Lord of all the armies of heaven is addressing you. He's speaking to you. That ought to, regardless of what opposition you're facing, when the Lord of hosts is speaking to you. That ought, to, that ought to resonate with you. That ought to carry some profound gravity. You know, I, I was watching this, um, this documentary on individuals that had been uh, convicted falsely, falsely convicted. And one of these individuals, they were reading their indictment, this federal indictment, and it read at the very top of it, the United States versus such and such. And they said when they read that, that was like... I have no chance. How? The the whole United States against me? How can I fare in this fight? Who can stand against this entire country? And so when we see the Lord of hosts speaking, that ought to give gravity that there is a commander of all the heaven's armies speaking to you and saying, this is what I am saying. Amen? Amen. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains in ruin? Now, we we, we may look at that and think that, well, okay, that's how you build a house. But no, this paneled housing, this was considered a luxury. This is typically what kings, how they would build their palaces. And this is interesting here because, see, um, It was right before they had gone into exile that God, through the prophet Jeremiah, had spoken against this king, uh, Shalem, who he was only considered and concerned with himself. And he had said, I'm going to build my palaces with all of these extensive rooms paneled with cedar. Well, he was exiled. He was pre-exiled because the king of Egypt exiled him. And so this would have resonated with them, that that this is the same attitude that had gotten them into the predicament they were they just come out of. This attitude of simply focusing on their own concerns, building their own houses in luxury. And I I, I like to think since um, Cyrus and many of the other Persian kings, when they sent these exiles back to their land, they gave them provisions to build the temple. And so it it seems to me there's a bit of misappropriation going on. That that, that stuff that should have went towards building, funds that should have went towards building the temple, people were building their houses. Do we see that? And so the same attitude, this internal way of life. Well, the, we, we, yes, we come and we worship the Lord. We come and we'll sacrifice to the Lord on this foundation. But yet we'll concern ourselves with ourselves. This is the same way of thinking that got them exiled in the beginning. This hollow faith, this hollow, this simply this ritualistic religion was meaningless. It was nothing. The prophet Isaiah speaks to this in the opening verses of that book when he says, God is making this complaint against the Israelites. He says, who told you? Who, who told you to come this and do this trampling of my courts? All of your feasts, your new moon feasts, your convocations, your Sabbath, I've grown weary of bearing them. 
I don't delight in the blood of bulls. This simple ritualistic religion. And so they're they're, they're beginning to turn back to the way. They're falling into the same mess that they were in before they were exiled. They were exiled. Now they're coming back, and now they're going back to the same way it was. Falling into the same mess that they were in before they left. You know, we can look at uh, Israel, the biblical account of Israel and how God dealt with them. And we can gain insight on that. We see that when Israel, whenever they were obedient, there was tribulation, there was turmoil, there was destruction, there was all kind of, there was no peace. And we can look at that and see that because God loved them, he chastised them. He was wanting, and when he chastises, he chastises those whom he loves for a reason, for a purpose. Because he's wanting us to be in right relation with him. Does that make sense? When we, when we go through something, when things are difficult, and you we typically know when God is chastising you, there ought to be something, a voice saying, you know what you did. You know why this is happening. It, it, it makes absolutely no sense to go back to the way you were doing what you were doing that got you chastised in the first place. And so it's a call to repentance. Do we see that? We go through things in life to get us to turn from a wayward way so we can right walk upright with the Lord. Amen? That is our prosperity when we are in a right relationship with God. Uh, fancy houses, panel houses, what they were concerning themselves with, or today what we concern ourselves with, what we consider prosperity, prosperity is right relation with God. Everything else is fleeting. Everything else is perishing. Our relationship with God will endure for all of eternity. Amen? We don't go back to the way things were pre the tribulation. There's a reason why we go through things to move us away from where we were to a better place. Amen. And, you know, I, I look at the church today. I've had opportunity to talk with a lot of pastors. I talk with a lot of pastors. I meet with a lot of pastors and we, we share what's going on right now in the church. A lot of the issues that they're dealing with, a lot of the things that people are griping and, and complaining about. And, and I, I just can't help but get the feeling that the church has kind of been in exile during this whole pandemic, that, that there is a, a sort of a trinkling in of the first ones that are coming out of this exile. You'd be surprised, but there are a lot of churches, a lot of churches that have yet to return to in-person worship. There are a lot of churches that have closed their doors permanently during this pandemic. A lot of pastors that have just given up and said, this is too much. You can't please these. You, you, you try to do this and, or you try to do that. And, and it's just an uproar on both sides. And so who needs it? It, it, it? I can't help but feel that the church has been in exile. And there is this slow trickling in of, of remnants of those that are wanting to come and are able to come and worship. And I, I, I hear this a lot, is that we are waiting for the right time. We are waiting for this pandemic to end. We're waiting for all of these um, restrictions to ease, the social distancing, the masks, the, the, the mandates. You know, we're, we're waiting. We're waiting for the opportune time. It's not time. Now is not the time yet. We're not ready. And there are those that are just completely content to stay home and watch and worship, fellowship, 
virtually, if such a thing is possible. Entire churches, battalions, divisions, companies, having abandoned their posts, the front lines. Since this pandemic began, there are, what, three-quarter of a million individuals that have died that they've attributed to this pandemic. 750 million or 750,000 people that have lost their lives. And I'm confident that the vast majority of them have stepped into eternity not knowing Christ as their Lord and Savior. This is not a time to have abandoned our posts. This is not a time to be waiting on the sidelines, waiting for things to get better when there are people that are dying, when there are souls that will perish for all of eternity because we are simply at home. We are waiting for the the right time. We're waiting for things to go a certain way. The time is now. And I'm... We're waiting, I, I see we're waiting for things to get back to the way they used to be, and I'm, I'm very happy that things will never get back to the way they used to be. We ought not want things to go back to the way things used to be, as if we were in this place of, of perfection. We, 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 we think about, oh, I'm waiting to get back to the, what we used to do, how we used to worship, how we used to praise. And, and as if that was a time where we were perfect, where we were coming together, we were shouting God's praises. And we were putting Christ first in all of our endeavors in our lives. And we were standing together with one voice as the body of Christ. Proclaiming his goodness until unless we had reached that, then we ought not want to go back to the way things were. We can never go back to the things where you ought not want to. We are looking to move to a place of right relation with Christ. And we can see that when we go through some things, when some things go wrong, when when all of this pandemic, all of this that has happened, it is God moving us into right relation with him. The time is now. But we look at and, and I can't, like I said, I can't help but see this parallel as, as these Israelites, they were waiting and they were watching and saying, well, the time, it's not time. We have all of this opposition. There were droughts, there were famine, there was hyperinflation, and it just didn't seem like the opportune time to serve the Lord. It wasn't convenient for them. The time is now. Verses 6 through 11. He's telling them, you've done all of this. You've you've, you've planted much, but you've harvested little. All that you sow, you reap very little. You, 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 You gain money and only to lose it. All that you sought to do in of yourself, it it is for naught. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Despite their very best efforts, they could not gain. And that ought to tell you something. You put the Lord first. Seek first the kingdom of heaven, and the rest will be get, given unto you. It's not the other way around. When God is first in your life, as I said, that relationship, that right relationship with God, it is our prosperity. That must take precedence in our lives. And it was not only them that was suffering. Look, it was the nations as well. Everyone else suffered. Because of this, the, the, the prophet Zechariah, he, he, he speaks of this as the Israelites, they had become a curse to all the nations. When the people of God are disobedient and they put God at the, the, the back of their priorities, the entire creation suffers as a whole. When the light that is called to be the light, when those that are called to be the light do not allow that light to shine, there is darkness. Amen. 
We are called to be the light. What good is it if you hide that light? You know, we complain about, you know, all that's going on. These people are trying to do that, and those people are trying to do this, and this is what the world is coming to. Everything is just out of, is in disarray, and the, hell, the world is going to hell in the handbag. And we complain, and we point the finger at everybody else but themselves. But if darkness is prevailing, it is because the light is fading. If evil is beginning to gain the upper hand, it is because the righteous are not walking in all righteousness. You can't blame the devil for being the devil. He's going to do exactly what he's going to do. Everything that is happening is happening for a reason. We are called to be the light of this world. And the thing is, if it can be as dark as it needs to be, you can go in a room, uh, a, a vast room, if we were somehow able to block out all the lights in this sanctuary and there was no light, if you just put a pinprick of light, that light will shine. You will see that light no matter how vast and how dark this room is because the light shall prevail. If we can understand that when we allow Christ in our life to shine, evil and darkness, it shall not prevail. It cannot prevail because we serve a Lord that has resurrected, that is seated on high, that sits at the right hand of God, that is prevailing. He has never lost a battle. He has never been defeated. We serve the all, the all living God that will reign. He reigns for all of eternity. We serve a mighty God, the only God, and he reigns. So when we allow Christ to shine in our lives, when we have that audacity, when we have that that unction, that feeling to just allow him to shine, he shall prevail. Amen. Look at what he says in verse 12. Read it for yourselves. Don't take my word for it. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedek. The high priest and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord, their God, had sent him and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. I am with you. He didn't tell him how he was going to do it. He didn't tell him what he was going to do, how, when, what, where. He just said, I am. With you. And, and that is that that ought to comfort you, that, that that ought to strike some sort of gravity with you, that when I am is with you, who can stand against you? When the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, the commander of all the heavenly beings is with you, what can possibly confront you? He says, I am with you. You don't need to know how. You don't need to know where. I am with you. Know that God is with you. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And his word is his bond. He is a God of his word. He stands on it. You can take it to the bank. Verse 14, it reads, So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Governor of Judah, in the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, in the spirit of the whole remnant of the people, they came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. This is good. Pay attention to this. This is the good stuff. This, this, when he says that the Lord stirred up, this is the word, the word er. It is a, a sequential, uh, non-perfect verb, imperfect Sequential imperfect, which is a fancy way of saying that this verb, it it, it provides sequence. You can read it and you know, okay, well, this is happening here. So that means this is happening exactly as he said it. So he's saying that this is happening when it's happening. Does that make sense? No. (laughs) It's happening in order. So let me break it down. So he's saying that he stirred up the spirits of all the people. 
Now, he stirred up their spirits after they were obedient to the word of the Lord. Amen. That happened first. They were obedient to the word of God. Then he stirred them up. Now look at what he says here in verse 10. Then they came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty. So it, they, they, they were obedient. There was a stirring. And then they began the work. So what does that say? That they had not yet begun the work But yet they were obedient in their hearts, in their minds, in their hearts. They had decided that they were going to do and they were going to follow the Lord. They were going to listen and they were going to do what God had called them to do. They had yet to even perform the work. But they had decided in their hearts there was a change, a a turning, a, a, a repenting, if you will. They turned to be obedient to God. And when you are obedient to God, when you decide that you are going to repent and you're going to turn from the mess that you were in and walk wholeheartedly with the Lord, he will cause a stirring up. He will cause an agitation. This word, er, it means an awakening, an arousal, an agitation of sorts. And when we decide to follow the Lord, he will awaken, he will arouse, and he will agitate things that we can complete the work that he called us to do. Somebody ought to say praise God, because that means that we don't have to do it ourselves. The battle is the Lord's and it's already been won. We just need to decide that this is what we're going to do. We're not going to go back to the way things were. We're going to move forward. We're going to put foot to Satan's rear posterior. He's going to get the hell out of here. When we decide to follow the Lord. Oh, he'll cause an awakening. He'll cause an agitation. He'll cause a stirring, a breaking down of things. There just has to be that initial turning in the heart to turn towards the Lord, to serve him wholeheartedly. This is what we're called to do. We have a commission. He's commissioned us to take this gospel to the ends of the earth. This is not the time to grow weary This is not the time to falter. Prayer warriors continue to pray, continue to call heaven down on this place. Continue to serve the Lord. Worshippers continue to worship, continue to cry out those praises. We need to hear it. We need to be led in it. We all have a job to do. Now is the time that we decide in our hearts that we are going to follow the Lord wholeheartedly. We're not going back to the way things used to be, but we're going to seek him this day with all diligence and all praise. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for this word of encouragement, Lord, that you are with us. The God of all the armies of heaven is with us. This is not our battle. It is yours, and it's already been won. We just need to decide to follow you. Father, I thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. We're not worthy of it, but why you deem to include us in your plan, I don't know. But Lord, we just thank you anyway. Thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that this word fall not on deaf ears. May it seep into the hearts of the people that we would be awakened, that we would be aroused, that we would stand on your word and believe. Oh God, we love you. We praise you. We give you this day. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.